Welcome to the Advocacy and Water Protection in Native California Speaker Series and Certification Program. Today, we're gonna to be talking about community organizing and creating a campaign. We're excited today to have Malaya Florendo and Sheraton Imanto. I hope I said that right. And if I didn't, I'm sorry. And, um, and welcome to Water Action August. We wish to acknowledge that we are here today, I am here today in Klamath, California on Yurok plans. Thank you to the Yurok tribe for all the great work that they do and for also working so hard for the Klamath River, which is nearby where I am right now. We also wish to express support to the Black Lives Matter movement and all the movements across the world for racial and environmental justice. We wish to send out our love and support today to Hoopa, California, which is located near my home in Orleans, California. Hoopa is now dealing with a small COVID-19 outbreak. If people wish to donate any PPE to the Hoopa Reservation, we can deliver it. Please remember everyone to stay safe, support your elders in your community in with, that has health conditions and wear a mask. And please be kind to each other at this time. We also have a fund to help get tribal members on the Klamath, Sacramento, Eel Rivers and other areas in rural California online and to get students computers. If you can donate, please do. If you need help getting online, please contact us. Please remember that a lot of people at this time do not have internet and are not able to engage in the policy decisions and that impact them, nor in educational opportunities such as this webinar. The digi digital divide is very re real in rural California and impacts a lot of tribal members within the state. Last, if you, lastly, if you are part of the certificate program, please remember to fill out your evaluation forms. They are due on October 1st. All previous webinars are on californiasalmon.org and on HSU's Native American Studies YouTube page. If you wanna go back and watch webinars, you can at any time and you can still participate in the certification program as long as you get all your, info, all your webinars done and your evaluation forms in by October 1st. So now I'm going to try to work, it's take one second for me to get my screen sharing going for my introduction to today's subject. So. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes, no? Yes? Yep, looks good. Okay, sorry, one yes. second. Oops, sorry. Ah, we're still learning all the tech, so I am sorry for any <laughs> issues we might have along the way. Okay, so like I said, the first thing we're asking you to do today is to take action for our rivers. There are really important decisions going on right now that impact both the Klamath River and the Sacramento Rivers. And they include um, whether or not the Klamath dams will come down. We are trying to make sure that Warren Buffett and Pacific Corps recommit to dam removal, as they said that they are not sure if they wanna go forward with the current dam removal agreement. So please take action by going to change.org and signing the petition. And please share on your social media with these hashtags that we need to make sure that people contact Warren Buffett and sign the petition. Um, also, sorry about that. I meant to mention, we will also be having action alerts all month that also pertain to the stopping the Delta tunnels and to stopping the Shasta Dam rays. It's very important that people engage in those issues and you can find out more by going to runforsalmon.org or by going to our website. So yeah, if you have a moment, please take action now to sign the petition and please check our website and our Facebook page, Facebook page and Twitter pages to find out about the continuing actions. At every webinar this month, we will be sharing an action with you because it's very important that we all engage in these important decisions. So on that, now I wanna introduce our subject for today. Um, community organizing and creating a campaign is the subject for today. 
I feel like community organizing is a very important part of any movement and any campaign. It's, however, it's not the only part of any movement or campaign. Um, so I wanted to say at the beginning though, however, I, um, it is important to be active and engaged in your community environment and it's inspiring and it's a wonderful thing, but it's also tiring and it can be heartbreaking. For many of us, this is a lifetime commitment and it's so important to keep grounded when you do this work in what you love, your love for justice and your love for the environment. It's also important to take care of yourself and your family, especially at times like these. We need to fight, but we also need to strategize and we need to enjoy the things we are fighting for. We need to make sure to rest and we need to make sure to reflect. It is also important to note, note that there is not only one way to organize. Today, we hope to share some skills and tools with everyone. However, I also wanna say everyone is unique and everyone's passions are unique and so is everyone's activism. Activism can include things like, things like art, organizing, filing lawsuits, or even feeding each other and caring for each other and our children. And it's more important now than ever to love and respect each other and each other's skill sets, passions, and each other's limits. Oops. Sorry about that. I'm not really sure why I'm not moving on. Okay. So there are many components of a successful, successful campaign. Community organizing and action are important parts of any campaign for justice, and they are focused today, but they're just parts of a movement or a campaign. It's important to respect all the different roles, as I said before, and the tools that we can utilize. Some of the other tools beyond community organizing and that interact with community organizing are things such as policy advocacy, legal work, uh, political work, education and research, media and outreach, creating events and engagement opportunities, taking direct action, fundraising, and doing direct community support. If you can right now, type, if you can right now, type some of the tools and roles that you can think of that are important when, do, when doing a campaign or engaging in a movement. It is also important when, to schedule your campaign and actions and to think about who, what are you doing? What is your goal? And who are you working with and who are you working against? It's important to map your allies and to map, power map your opponents. And hopefully if we have enough time today, we're gonna do some exercises in this area. Along with coordination and recognizing your opportunities and thinking about it's important to think about escalation and it's important to think about all the aspects of a campaign and a movement. For instance, you don't usually just start a campaign by um, taking action or disrupting a meeting because you want to start by asking for what you want in maybe a more um, calm way. So um, it's important to think about where are your opportunities? Um, where are the points of decision? Where are the points of destruction within your campaign? Perhaps um, it start, it's going through a CEQA or NEPA process, a public process where at the beginning at the scoping period, you can ask for what you want. And, um, but then towards the end is when you really wanna be taking more aggressive action. Who knows, there's, like I said, there's many different ways to organize a campaign. It's also important to think about media. Um, it's important to think about legal and action strategy. It's important to make sure you're coordinating with all of your allies and that all of your efforts are working in, together. You don't want to be going, going this alone or you're definitely going to burn yourself out. And also you're not going to be successful if you're not taking moments to think strategically and to make sure that your efforts are um, impactful and that you're working closely with your community and checking in a lot. Community organizing, like I said, is an important part of a campaign, but it's not only about going to a protest, a hearing or an action. Without an organized campaign that analyzes, sorry if I have any mistakes in this, but um, all the roles and opportunities and includes your community and allies in every step of the way, your campaign will likely be unsuccessful. And this is really important because um, I work for an environmental group and I have for a long time. And we as environmentalists um, have 
sometimes don't make sure to always take the time to engage our communities in every step of the way. And it's just really important, especially when you're working with native communities and other frontline communities. Um, you can't be making your plans without including people in the plans or else you're not really um, making movement and building a campaign that's gonna be successful. So like I said, it's so important to realize there's so many aspects to activism and movements and that everyone has a part to play. It's not just one tool that is gonna be make you successful. So on that, I wanted to just put out there really quickly that education is a part of activism. Com doing community events that are centered around and come from the youth is part of activism. This is the Klamath River Run for Salmon, which was created by local native youth. Sometimes actions are not conf confrontational, but they are include sharing what is important to us and, and sharing what other people might not understand. Not everyone's coming coming to the from the same place of knowledge. Um, this is actually artwork by Malaya, who's our presenter today. And I just wanted to say that art is also activism and activism art is extremely important to our movements. Direct action is activism. And um, this is a picture of us at Warren Buffett's store in Omaha during his shareholders meeting. And um, we didn't do anything illegal at this time, whereas direct action can be either legal or illegal activities. But um, it, is a, it is one of the many tools in the toolbox and we will discuss that more later. Um, this is also Malaya, since she was here today, I used a couple pictures with of hers, but um, testifying in a um, room where you're not always invited is also can be activism for sure. Um, this is actually at a water board hearing about flows going into the Sacramento River and about restoring flows. And um, this is Malaya testifying in a lot of these meetings, unfortunately, and we're going to talk about this at later um, webinars, are during the day and in places far away from where we are located. And so um, just being able to get to places like this, which are like five to seven hours away and make sure that um, indigenous voices and youth voices and diverse voices are actually presented at these kind of hearings is activism. And it's important to think to realize that. Fishing and um, reviving tr traditional practices could be activism. This is a picture of people eeling on the Klamath River and people had to fight really hard for their rights to fish on the river as we talked about at the last webinar. Um, and the fact is most successful campaigns can last years and include many tools and strategies, including community activism. Some local examples include the campaign to stop the Pacific Connector Pipeline, the campaign to undam the Klamath, work to bring back traditional burning in tribal lands and to let fires burn in some areas, work to make sure that marine life protected areas are open to traditional gathering and work to make sure that ceremonies are allowed and protected on forest surface lands are all um, campaigns that and work that have been successful. And if you can um, take a minute, minute to drop some examples of the successful campaigns that you know about and some of the tools that you think are um, made them successful. And um, one of the last things I wanted to say, because I feel like it's important and please feel free to continue to use the chat while I'm speaking. Um, is that there are movements and campaigns that can last lifetimes. And it is really important to remember that no activism or organizing is ever done in vain. Um, it's really easy to get depressed because of the state of the world and the state of our climate right now. But the fact is, is that real change, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint and making change is vitally important at this point in time. Um, and it is actually about life and death for a lot of us, especially the people that are working on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis, and especially people that are working on the front lines of the climate crisis. And for a lot of people who rely on the rivers for um, their way of life and for their food source, it also 
it seems is a matter of life and death. You know, these are long struggles and it's just important to think of it that way. You might lose some battles, but that does not mean, it doesn't mean that you're not making change. Um, every action and campaign leads to the next and every skill that you learn and lesson will inform the future of your activism and the movements for justice and environment. Um, a larger example is the Black Lives Matter work being done. Um, it's, uh, it's been a long time before so many people have come out and decided to say publicly that they support Black lives and that they'll fight for them. It's, um, some of these fights are multi-generational. Some of these fights are gonna, going to keep lasting, um, but we have to continue them. Um, some local examples are movements to save the clam salmon or stop the Delta tunnels and the Shasta Dam race. They've been going on for generations and often there are people, grandparents and grandkids at the same rallies or people telling stories of those who have passed on that have been part of these struggles. And that's why it's really important also to avoid burnout and despair and to make sure that none of us act as gatekeepers or um, engage in skill hoarding or hoarding of knowledge. We have to take the time to teach each other, um, to teach our youth and to make sure everyone can get the information and education on these issues that they need. Um, it, we always have to be reflecting, changing and mentoring and working with the next generations. And um, we need to do this even when it includes calling ourselves out and when it's hard. And some of these, a recent example is that um, the Sierra Club um, actually acknowledging their racist past and the, some of the things that their founders did that were really unhealthy and not okay. And talking about how they're gonna change that internally and work on changing the environmental movement to be more just. And um, I would like to give a shout out for the Sierra Club for doing that work because not many environmental organizations are. And on that, I'd like to move on. But um, I also would like to say that this is Water Action August. And um, we are asking people to use that hashtag, um, to use the hashtag water justice, water is life, and to think about what environmental issues are important to you? What issues of justice are important to you? How are you addressing them? Who are you working with? Are you making sure to include the people on the front line and the indigenous communities within that work? And if you're not, then how are you gonna change your behavior to do that? Because we're not gonna be able to make change just by ourselves. And we're definitely not gonna be able to make change if we're not talking to the people who are most impacted. Um, and not, and not, and if we're not acknowledging the people who came before us. So, um, with that, I wanted to introduce Malaya, who's going to be our first presenter today, and she's also going to be working with us on some interactive activities. And um, we're really excited to have you, Malaya. So, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate uh, Regina for reaching out. Um, I've actually done some work with Save California Salmon in the past, and definitely our paths are always um, crossing through all these different movements, so it's awesome that we're able to do this together. Um, I just want to introduce myself. Ayukui Neknao Malaya Florendo, Crescent City Auk, Wishkwa Esihapao Mekwamechak, Nechekwa Analia Hillman, Nipsechwa Lauren Florendo Esi Chukchuk Hillman. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone for um, being here today, and I really appreciate all of you listening and coming to learn because this is organizing you participating and, you know, being present and learning about this stuff is organizing and it is making a change. So I appreciate everyone for um, being here and listening. I do want to try and, you know, get through this kind of fast because I want to be able to leave time for you all to be able to, well, one for our other presenters. Sheridan to be able to speak um, to what they're doing in their community as well as doing some power mapping which is going to be a really awesome activity. So um, let me share my screen. I have a small presentation. So um, today I'm just going to kind of be going over some community organizing strategy um, 
through the Arc of Organizing, which is a tool that I uh, use often and learned from other amazing organizers um, from different areas. More specifically, I really learned this from the Yo Cali uh, Emerging Organizers Fellowship that they have. Um, I think they're based out of Oakland, California, but they do work all up and down uh, California. And I think they're doing some work currently with Save California Salmon. They're an amazing organization who really um, uplifted me um, as a youth organizer in my community. And it was an amazing opportunity and I learned a lot. And yeah, this ARC is one of those tools that um, I really gained from that. So today I just kind of want to go through a little bit of like what I do and where I'm coming from um, and then kind of going over just really briefly. I know Regina touched a lot on what, you know, community organizing really is, but I'll just go over it really quick as well. Um, and kind of going into, you know, the strategy part of organizing and um, yeah, how, how do you use this arc in organizing strategy? Um, and with that, we're gonna kind of segue into um, Sheraton's piece on more of like, how are we organizing in these times of isolation with the pandemic going on? Um, it really is a big uh, issue that's, you know, getting in the way of a lot of these movements that are still happening and are still, you know, at a fast pace, whereas the world is kind of slowing down around us. And so we're having to find um, ways to navigate that and be able to organize in our communities. So um, I just want to start off, um, I already introduced myself, but I am Malaya Florendo, I'm currently on Talua Diné land. So I want to acknowledge the land that I'm on and I encourage all of you to acknowledge the land that you're um, on today, even um, if you're just watching make sure you acknowledge the land that you're on always. And um, yeah, I currently reside on Talawa Diné lands and I am originally from the, uh, the villages of Wishquel and Hapau, which are uh, near the mouth of the Klamath River here in Northern California. I grew up also in Eugene, Oregon where there's always a lot of work going on there as well as far as organizing. And I grew up there with my mother who was going to school at the time. Um, she's an artist. She's an activist, you may know her, Analia Hillman. And she um, is probably my biggest inspiration for the work that I've been doing. And she's the one who really encouraged me and um, taught me in the, the importance of organizing, like why we should be doing this. Um, we lived in Eugene, Oregon, and that's, you know, more city. And, um, you know, it's, it was a lot farther away from being able to practice our culture. So we moved back to the Klamath River when I was really, very young. And at that time, around the early 2000s, um, is when this issue of the, the fish kill really came to light or it was really um it was really active in its timeline so it was a very heavy time and my mother met my stepfather uh lee for choo choo kilman as some of you may know him and they um were big uh workers on this movement in the early 2000s for the undamned the klamath um, and that's currently um something that's going on and regina mentioned um, some of the current work being done for that uh, same campaign. But in the early 2000s, that was um, kind of what I grew up on and organizing around and being dragged to protests as a little kid. And um, it was definitely a very heavy and sometimes traumatizing situation, but it was also a very heavy and wonderful experience and learning experience for me as a youth um, growing up on the river because it helped me understand like why it's important to be fighting for the river and um, I remember not being able to fish as a kid and hearing about the fish kill and um, not being able to fish now like it was a very it was a huge impact on me as a child and it slowly snowballed into the work that I'm doing now because of going through that trauma of growing up in this time where, you know, fishing is becoming 
almost like non-existent and it's very terrifying and traumatizing and sad to not be able to practice that as a um, cultural practice for myself um, and for my people. So it was a very heavy time that really, like I said, snowballed and emerged into doing the work that I do. Um, I love to, you know, I, my, I, passion as an indigenous person you know is fighting for an environmental justice because that is such a huge aspect of our culture um it's really like part some of the core of it so it's um something that i was very passionate about but i currently um am working for rx safe del nort here in crescent city which we um are working to um fight against opioid use disorder in our communities and how to help people um, find um, safe pathways through addiction and finding recovery and healing and wellness. So that's really um, the work that I do now, um, which isn't very like isn't environmental justice, but it all coincides with each other and it it all um, the pathways all meet up in the end. So um, I still do some work here, um, grassroots work on the side, especially right now, the no LNG movement um, was really a big one that I was working on in my personal time uh, for the past few years. Um, and as you can see here, the pictures, we have a picture from um, back around the same time that Regina had those pictures. Uh, I don't know if it was the same protest, but um, around the same time, a banner drop, and then we have another banner drop for the no LNG movement. So that's just a little bit about me. <laughs> um, I This is my passion. This is my work. I'm also an artist. So art is something that is really a huge role for me in the organizing movement. I love to make pieces that um, represent what we're trying to say, like that's kind of my way of communicating and speaking out. Um, so that that is kind of the role I've taken on in currently while I'm doing other work. And um, as you as we'll kind of get into how roles, you know, work for people that not everything is always, you know, dropping banners or carrying signs or, you know, giving really badass speeches, but um, so we'll, we'll kind of get into how that works. So what really is community, community organizing? Like the, the technical definition is the coordination of cooperative efforts and campaigning carried out by local residents to promote the interests of the community. Yes, and that's the very technical sense of, the, of community organizing, but really it's empowering our people, it's making change in our communities, it's really, it's a way of life because um, it, a lot of these issues affect our daily lives, especially as Indigenous peoples. Um, the land that uh, is being occupied today, um, all of these uh, very destructive and genocidal practices of, um, for example, uh, dams being put on rivers, pipelines, um, you know, water diversion, the, the list goes on. And those are all issues that affect our daily lives as indigenous peoples. And so that is, it's a little, it's, it is a way of life for us is having to learn how to organize and um, be a community because we have always um, in our area had villages and had community all around us. And um, so it's really like transferring that um, cultural knowledge and practice into modern day community organizing. So as an organizer, um, it's not, it's a common misconception that organizing is uh, kind of the leader or the boss role when that's not what it is at all. It is a position of leadership in a more responsible sense. It's more to build a collective power with people to work towards a common goal. So it's kind of just like, you know, a gentle push to help people get um, on the same path. Um, 
So it, sh like I said, it should not be a position of authority and there's always more power when we are working together. There is no specific designated role for, orga for an organizer. Like I said, their roles are very, they, you can jump from roles, you can have multiple roles at once. Like there is no rule for having roles in community organizing. It's very um, flexible because people have so many different skills and so many different passions. Like it's totally normal to have multiple roles. And it's a, it's a practice of always learning. Like I will never stop learning about organizing. Um, I still don't know enough. <laughs> no one really does. And it's definitely a process of learning. Um, like there isn't always a technical win in all of this. And there isn't any really losing because we're always learning and gaining knowledge and um, new strategies. So it's, a, it's an experience. The long-term strategy of the organizer really is to build and train leaders to the point where they are able to do the work of the organizer and lead campaigns. Um, I love to use memes in my slides, so sorry, <laughs> they're a little fun, um, but I love this meme because it kind of represents like as an organizer, it's so hard, the work that you're doing, like you want to do other stuff too, like you have a, you also have a life you're trying to live. Um, and you're thinking about all the awful stuff going on in the world, you know, I know it can be really hard, but remembering that there are people who are learning always and who are training to also be leaders in their communities. So we want as community organizers are there to encourage that and help, you know, guide people um, to take on that work in the future. Um, this this image, I know, not it does not list every type of activism. Not everyone likes it, you know, some of these terms. But I think a lot of these terms get a lot of uh, negative slack when I don't think they always should. Um, the use of grassroots activism, a lot of the work that we do independently, especially as Indigenous people, it is hard to find funding. It's hard to find organizations that want to work in Indigenous communities because it is a very interesting learning experience for allies um, trying to work in Indigenous communities on Indigenous land. It can be, um, it's also a very difficult experience, but so we see a lot of grassroots activism in Indigenous communities, but we also see a lot of uh, all of this really like hashtag activism. I think it's a bad rap, but there are some amazing things that come out of hashtag activism. Protesting, um, of course, we see a lot of effective work done with protesting, but it isn't always the best strategy. So um, we encourage people to, you know, look at all of these, learn what they are. Um, this is not the entire list. There is so much to this, um, but these are just some of the common terms you may see in the media today. So I do want to do a fun little activity today. Um, as you all kind of heard some of the um, examples of community organizing going on in Northern California and other areas, um, I want to know what you guys have for examples. I know that we can often go into the chat, but this was a great tool I learned from the wonderful Kacha Rizling Baldi. She had a wonderful presentation where she, um, hold on one second. She did a word cloud and I would love to see a word cloud come out of this. So um, what you're going to do is give me one moment. Technical difficulties as always. All right, so it is activated. So what you're going to do is you can either go to the link, which I am putting into the chat right now, and it is a poll somewhat. So you, um, it is a poll with the question, what are some examples of community organizing to you? Um, there, there's not really wrong answers, um, but so just answer it with one word if you can. Um, you can go to pollev.com slash Malaya, F-L-O-R-E-664, and there you can respond, or you can text um, this phrase, M-A-H-L-I-J-A, F-L-O-R-E-664 to 37607 
to um, join the activity and um, input your word. And so we'll go ahead um, and get started if anyone wants to respond. Um, again, you're gonna go to respond at pollev.com slash M-A-H-L-I-J-A-F-L-O-R-E-664. And I'm just gonna kinda show um, what is building right now um, in this word cloud. And we're getting a lot of wonderful um, feedback such as community. Yes, community uh, itself is organizing, um, building relationships. Art, of course, is um, community organizing. It's a way of getting um, your words out there, getting your, um, really expressing your community through art um, can be voting. Um, there's a lot on here. You guys are awesome. Demonstration, presentations, yes. Collaborating is a great one. Mutual trust, I love that one. That is a, a very effective <laughs> community organizing. Parades, marches, protests, yes. Media, uh, let's see. Divestment, that is a good one. Webinars, webinars can be, be community organizing for sure, writing. Is that free dinners? <laughs> Some of these are hard to uh, uh, connect because they're all um, the same color, but I love it. <laughs> um, building, yes. Calls, sign, campaign, women's aid, communication. Yeah, these are all amazing. Um, so the poll is full, so we won't be... Uh, accepting any more, but um, thank you everyone to who responded and we will definitely, I will keep this cloud so that people can um, see what it looks like in the future. Cause maybe you wanna get some ideas. Maybe you wanna see this word cloud and get a feel for what um, it really means and you know, how to build what to build off of. It's a beautiful representation. So um, thank you everyone to everyone who participated. And um, yeah, think about that at home. Like the list goes on. Yes, we think about protests, we think about divestment, we think about, you know, hard action, but really um, community organizing could be anything. It could be um, going to have a, a food drive. It could be, yeah, the, the list goes on. It could be anything. So really like go home. I want everyone to go home and think about um, all the different things that can be community organizing. The list goes on. So I encourage it. So um, I want to kind of zoom through the arc, um, but we're just going to kind of be going over what the arc of organizing is. It really is an amazing tool that I learned from Yo Cali. Shout out to Yo Cali for all their amazing education and the work that they do. Um, so the arc of organizing is this idea that um, it's kind of like a guide or a, a planning strategy um, for building your campaign and, you know, kind of making it happen and you know how to like how to finish it off or how to celebrate those wins after you've completed this arc. Um, so it is an idea of um, building your campaign and executing it. So the arc kind of st starts with the encounter which is really understanding yourself and your story and making time for meeting people and building those relationships. So this is a time when you're really building up your network and building those relationships with other people and um, kind of making those connections of like, how are, we, how are we working together? How does this affect all of us? And what, what are we gonna do about this? And kind of like, yeah, what, what connects us? This is kind of the glue that starts this whole um, project. And then we kind of go into disruption, which this is, this is 
uh, when people think disruption, they think something kind of more destructive, but really disruption is something as simple as having one-on-ones with people and building that coalition of people or an LOC, a uh, local organizing community and honing in on those issues that an LOC can committee to build to building a campaign around. So this is kind of the awakening and this will happen as you're entering people um, and as you are entering with people, uh, it kind of goes over the day in the life and making them be aware of the issue and walking them to building shared power to make change. So this kind of disruption and um, the encounter kind of go hand in hand. Um, it's really building that idea and what we're going to do with it with the people around us. So then we get into remaining and this is more like a strategy really is like building your strategy, creating a new vision of how things should and could be. So looking at the future, um, what you want the your future world to look like versus how it looks like right now and how it could realistically look like. And this can be built with your local organizing committee and definitely should be something that's built together um, as a community. Uh, it's obviously a lot um, more strategic to work with those um, around you than working on loan. So definitely this takes a lot of research and um, understanding of those that you are fighting against, the targets are, who the targets are, and just kind of strategizing around that. Um, so this takes a lot of research, a lot of effort. Organizing isn't just writing a sign and going and standing on the corner. While you can do that in some cases, that's not always the case. So we want to encourage the idea that um, the strategy, the, the action isn't necessarily the organizing. The strategy and the relationship building is also a part of that. It's an entire plan. It's not just one um, direct action that happens. And I think that's a common misconception of community organizing. So now we get into action and this, um, this really, I, I would define it as a radical system transformation. Like this is something that is really going to make the actual difference. Um, we see a lot of examples such as signing petitions. That is a great action. Um, that is making effective change, that's getting the word out there, that's um, teaching people that this, that they are, they can be a part of this without having to stand on the street and fight directly um, with NVDA, nonviolent direct action. Um, and it is an effective um, form of organizing. It puts pressure on our targets and, and it can look many different ways. It's not just signing a petition, there's so many. Um, and many of you listed a lot of them in the word cloud. And then you're going to kind of go into reflection and follow up. Um, so reflecting on your, um, with your uh, organizing committee on what happened, how it worked, um, you know, kind of reviewing like, okay, how did this work for us? Did was it successful? Which, you know, there is no real successful, definite successful action. Like you're gonna have ups and downs. There's not gonna be a general win, but the real wins are the learning and the building. And sometimes, you know, you do, you win and you get those bills passed or you get them to listen to you or you get your, um, your uh, words published, like that is an awesome win and it's all learning, it's all building what works for this community and effective change. So sometimes you have to follow up the decision with the decision makers if they agree to make radical change and make sure you hold them accountable to the changes they agreed to help make. So just because you win or you had a successful action, still keep them accountable. And this is an important idea that I think is um, sometimes gets forgotten about because we're so, we get burnt out, it happens. Um, organizing is work, <laughs> but you wanna make sure that you're following up with those, even those that you're targeting. And celebrate your wins. Like even if it's, you know, having conversations and um, that was your win, 
building community relationships, that's your win. Maybe your action was successful and you got what you wanted for the outcome, that's a win. Like the wins, it, it is a spectrum and it ranges so much of what a win is. So I don't want to discourage people. Like I want them to be encouraged that you learned something that is a win. So <laughs> this meme, is this the end or the beginning? Like this is not the end celebrate your wins and because that is going to be the beginning of the next stages in this movement it never ends um <laughs> we wish it could but really it's beautiful to see people coming together and making change happen it's not going to end so celebrate while you can and learn from that and um find what works for you know the upcoming and so now I kind of want to pass the mic to Sheridan, who's really going to be going into um, how do we organize in a time of isolation, in a time where we are in a pandemic, it's hard to be with people, connect with people face to face. Um, Zoom is amazing, but it's not quite that same feeling as being in person, but there are people who are making it work and doing amazing work in their communities regardless. And so I just want to pass it to Sheridan, who's going to be um, talking a little bit about some of the work that they're doing in their community and some amazing movements that are happening. So, um, aloha, mahalo e malaya, and thank you also, uh, Regina, thank you both. Um, Aloha Mike Kako everyone. Just want to make sure if someone in the chat, can everybody hear me? I just want to make sure, um, that my sound is good, awesome. Just because I am on the road. And um, I also want to say, I apologize if there's any background noise, um, but I um, also want to let you know that I have my mask <laughs> with me and that um, I'm also, not close to anyone. Um, so yeah, but if, just in case, if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, and yeah, um, I just want to, uh, again, my name is Sheridan Oyelani Inamoto. I currently reside uh, actually in Akchakchai territory, which is also known as Western or Southern Pomo territory. And I'm really grateful to be on the call with all of you. And um, I thought, that Regina, you opened up um, some really great, and Malaya made some really great points and outlines. Um, I just want to kind of emphasize something um, that was spoken to about just, you know, like getting into activism and organizing. So as I started, when I started, um, I actually didn't think I was going to be a community organizer. I didn't even think that was going to be even in my path. But about five years ago, I was invited to join um, what uh, the Winnemo went to actually led, indigenous led Run for Salmon. And from that year, uh, that first year of the run, which follows the watershed from the Bay of Ohlone territory all the way up to Winnemo Wintu territory, um, a major water source uh, for California waters. Um, just joining that, just being a participant in that journey and that pers perspective and being at the source dramatically changed my life. And it actually led me into organizing. So if for any of you who feel like, you know, you know, do you have to be, um, you know, do you have to have a background? Did you, you know, a lot of activists that I know and a lot of organizers I know did not wake up and say, oh, I want to be an activist today. Um, often it's just a need and there is a passion and there is a need to, you see something is wrong or there's not, there's an injustice or there needs to, people need to be informed about what's going on. And if you need, something needs to get done, sometimes you just need to do it yourself. And so I'm really grateful to the journey um, called The Run for Salmon because it led me to a whole nother life and work and learning about what it means to be in community. And in many ways, um, a journey like the Run for Salmon, which follows a watershed, 
is actually a teacher all by itself. So when we are talking about there's many different ways of organizing, many different paths to show up in community, I often like to say there are many streams that lead to one ocean. So there isn't necessarily one stream is better than the other. We need everybody and we need all the threads. And I think Regina and Malaya really made a good point about that and the importance of collective um, that we, I can't do this by myself. And I just want to say that even though I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the run for salmon at where we are today, given the climate that we are in with the COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic, um, that I don't come by myself. I actually come with a we, not an I. And I know a lot of you who are watching this call are part have been, have been a part of the Run for Salmon, have participated in the Run for Salmon, have given their own um, gifts and interests and skill sets. Whether it, I, I saw on the list, which was and also that wonderful word cloud um, exercise, but I also saw earlier people were saying, you know what are ways to be involved, you know, active listening, but, you know, really sometimes it's, it's showing up with uh, being a medic or, um, you know, providing security or, you know, there's so many different ways to participate um, in the collective and we need everyone. So community organizing is definitely a we. And I often say that in, in the, in the interest of the English language, it's a difference of prepositions. So it's really about the with and not the for. So, community organizing that I learned through an indigenous led movement is really about the we and the with and working together. And as Malaya pointed out that um, it is definitely a commitment. It, it doesn't necessarily go away overnight, unfortunately. Sometimes I wish there were just successful wins and that's it. We take one action and that's great. But actually we're really building and revisiting and reconnecting um, what it means to live in community too and to be a part um, and work together. And I think that's really important um, to stress that because even when you get burned out or when you're on your own, um, we really look, look to each other to help us move through something together. So I just wanted to um, highlight some of those things that were shared just from my own personal experience. Um, I, I know that in the chat, there was a link to the runforsalmon.org. I don't know if Carrie or Regina, if we could pull it up and actually bring it onto the screen. Um, Cause I like to share something about um, what it means to, perfect, thank you, to do a run um, during the time where we're having to isolate where a lot of the energy around us is, um, is, is kind of encouraging us to, to not be connected, to be disconnected. It's very individualistic. It feels very isolating. But please know that, um, like Malaya pointed out, that there's still um, activism and, you know, and the collective movement still happening. And I'm really grateful to say that the fifth year of the Run for Salmon um, is exactly still strong, probably stronger than ever. Um, and I want to just kind of highlight a little bit more like what is, so this specific, specific Run for Salmon, um, which is actually connects to all the different runs that are related to salmon, but really it's our watershed. This particular run is bringing back the, um, a particular run of Chinook salmon that are native to uh, the Bay, Delta, Sacramento, um, Winnemum or McLeod River watershed. It is all, um, it, it's a very, it's like over 300 miles. It's a very large watershed. Um, it touches many different territories and um, also brings a lot of awareness to, you know, where our water comes from. And so this journey started literally five years ago with a vision from Chief Kalyan Sisk and the Winnemum went to. And it actually was tied to an action to not raise the Shasta Dam. There was video and footage of an action uh, that the tribe did five years ago or several years ago. And that actually, that filming and documentation of their stance against the Shasta Dam led, uh, spread around the world. And in Aotearoa or in New Zealand, um, a fish sports uh, fishermen, sports fishermen actually caught wind of this documentary and saw what the tribe was doing and brought awareness around their salmon. And they actually contacted the tribe and said, we actually have your salmon that you thought 
that people thought was completely extinct. And so the run for salmon was born out of the, um, the, the truth and the desire to return those salmon back home to their native lands or watershed. So that is the, the, the quick summary of how the run for salmon started. If there's any other information people want to throw into the chat, it's fine because like I said, um, I'm a, one of many threads in the movement and the collective of the Run for Salmon team. And I really encourage you to everybody um, to take your time even after we leave this to, um, uh, after we have this talk to take a look at that, the runforsalmon.org that's on the screen. If we could get it back, I don't know where it went. There it is, yay. Um, but take your time and, and go back and take a look at the journey and get more details of the history and how the, the vision started. Um, really quickly, I do wanna ask everybody a quick question. Um, does everyone know where their water comes from? And does everyone know who their watershed is? Um, and I, I'm asking the who and not really a what, because um, me having Hawaiian ancestry, um, and having a Hawaiian perspective of, of, of kind of coming through this as well is in Hawaiian, we actually often ask, you know, who you are is not just your name or even your necessarily your ancestry, but it's also like, who is, who is your mountain? Who is the land that you, where you live? Who is the watershed? And it's a who and not a what. So that really changes the perspective about something that is living and not just objectifying. Um, it's not just a thing, right? And so if we thought about our, the areas and, and the land in which sustains us or this idea of the earth being a who and not a what, especially our waters, maybe we would think and relate to our waters differently. But really important. So as we look at this website, if you scroll and you look on the first page, it talks about um, how, you know, how do we get involved during this pandemic? So this fifth year, um, the Run for Salmon had to get really creative. The collective team, the community organizing team had to get really collect, uh, creative about how we're going to still continue this journey, even though we cannot have we cannot gather in large groups like we we would the, for the past four years and so if you look on the the website if you um if regina if you kind of scroll up you'll see there's a list of different things there are um videos of going to your local watershed um posting about it have you you know um doing uh there's different film and documentary to watch and so people this was this run actually did happen um we're in the re-evaluation we're in the evaluation stage according to malaya's <laughs> order or of organizing or the arc of organizing we're kind of at the end of that organizing phase right now at the moment and we're debriefing but um the run took place the last two weeks of july and we so we just finished and yet it's still active. And what's really cool about having, I mean, there is a benefit of having technology and the website um, is because these, the journey can actually live beyond act, being there in person. So the, I wanted to also highlight something on this website. Um, if you go Regina to, there's the front page and then there's a, on the, on the, on to the right of like different ways to get involved. There's a little link that says, or, or a graph, a graphic that has mini lessons. And if you could click on that graphic, I just wouldn't really want to highlight this because Regina had mentioned about, you know, she was talking about education and the importance of different ways of, you know, being involved and active, especially with youth led movements and leadership. Um, academies that I know that are out there as well, and also highlighting um, learning and getting informed. So this was a really another creative tool that the Run for Salmon team came up with that can be accessed at any time. And because a lot of us are having to stay home, a lot of parents or a lot of um, you know guardians of different. Uh, Guardian, youth guardians, people who have to take care of kids are often having to, to take on teaching roles that they normally wouldn't have. Um, this curriculum was developed for the Run for Salmon and it was developed. I want to give a shout out to um, Nichelle and Dessa. They are, fourth, they are teachers, one's a fourth grade teacher, one's a librarian, um, but they work in education and they actually created a curriculum for the Run for Salmon. And 
um, we were able to, and this was originally written for, for teachers to share in their classroom, but given COVID and the pandemic, now you can take these lessons and this learning right in your home. And it can also involve and include families uh, to participate. So this is a really cool, it's a map of the run that the, the watershed that we usually take, but this time, um, rather than having dates and where we're going to be, we actually incorporated the lessons and it has different themes. So we want to talk about the Shasta Dam and all of those actions that are coming up or the Delta, but this is actually being able to teach. And this is a form of activism and also reminding people to go back to the source of their water and their watershed. And what is a watershed, for example, or, you know, when we, when we have all these, these ideas and concepts or when we're talking about different justice issues or different environmental actions sometimes we have to kind of start with the basics of like you know um like what malaya did wonderfully too is like what is community organizing or what does it mean to talk about water what do we what do we mean when we talk about dams certain things um that we when you're getting into organizing often it's easy to forget or take for granted that you have that information already but not everyone knows that so i think this is really a great way um to still be involved and aware and informed and engaged and active in um, community, different issues, especially around water and watersheds, but we really need to come back to, um, and especially in California. Um, and this also, this particular mini lesson curriculum is really great too, because it, it stays throughout the year. It's not just one event or one time of the year, or, you know, just for a couple of weeks, like it normally would. So there has been an amazing blessing in having this pandemic at this time, because it's actually having us reflect and go within about, you know, what's close to home? How are we involved? Um, are there actions that we can get involved with right in our own house um, or right in our own backyard, right? And um, there's also ways to engage and still keep our elders safe, still keep our youth safe too during this time. I know a lot of movements aren't able to do their runs like they, they normally would. Um, if there's any time though, I do wanna say that if we ever got together in small groups, again, we have our PPE, we have our masks, we have hand sanitizers, we uh, have strict protocol if you're going to. I do recommend that if you're going to do some kind of movement outside, um, I know there have been a lot of movements that have been happening, but there, it's really important to, um, especially with a lot of the, some other runs that are like run, salmon or watershed related to make sure that you have a really strong medic team, that you have, um, that you're always following those kinds of safety protocols. I don't wanna dismiss that. And um, any time that if any one of the organizers or folks who ever did get together, even if it's like two of us, three of us, four of us, we always have our mask. We're always prepared and um, really, you know, thinking about being safe with each other. Um, because again, um, you know, some actions are, are short and sweet, but for the most part, from what I've learned, it is definitely a commitment for the long haul. And, um, and I will say that sometimes celebrations and successes are simply things like, um, you know, the Shasta Dam is not raised, AO, right? That's, that's a win <laughs> today. And sometimes it's a day to day and you have to celebrate those wins, you know, all the time. Um, and the more and more that I'm able to be a part of the Run for Salmon and be connected to the water and to, and to understand the watershed in a whole nother way and actually going and returning to the source, um, has really um, transformed and engaged me in, a, in, in a, just a deeper understanding of what we're, what's, what, what we're worth, what's worth really like quote unquote fighting for, but really I know that it's not only for all of the, the, the folks that kind of have come before us, but for the next generations that will be coming. And I know that Anytime we do this work or we're engaged or we're adding to the stream or we're being a, you know, a path or a thread into community organizing, know that it matters and it has a huge impact. Um, everything counts. Even, I just wanna also do a shout out because I noticed Malaya, you were wearing a Mauna Kea shawl <laughs> uh, that Regina had posted of you. And I just wanna say, I, I kind of put this in the chat, but you know, fashion, what you wear, 
Um, I know it ranges from like, sometimes people decorate their cars. Sometimes they have bumper stickers they put on their water bottles, but for sure, um, you know, what you wear, this is a run for salmon shawl. Um, I'm also part of the Protect Mauna Kea movement, which is in Hawaii, protecting mountains, which are all related to our waters and watersheds, no matter where we are. So yeah, I just wanted to um, highlight that kind of form of activism. We can get as creative as we want, but just know that everything that you do matters. And even wearing a shawl sparks conversation or somebody notices or they, they start chatting on a post about what you do or uh, why, why are you wearing something? Or even if you're taking a self selfie, it's like you can highlight, um, you know, even what you're wearing in the photo. So definitely, I, I love that um, Malaya that really highlights artwork. Um, a lot of movements are all visual and um, there's so many creative artists. We also have a lot of talented uh, singers in the Run for Salmon group. So there's a lot of songs we have. Um, different videos of sing-alongs. We have Run for Salmon songs. So musicians out there, music, if you want to contribute, there are so many ways to come together. And I hope that I'm looking forward to seeing more creative ways as these actions and movements uh, continue and that we need everybody. We need everybody together um, in any way you can. So mahalo everybody, thank you all for signing those petitions, there will be more, there'll be more actions to come um, for being a part of this group, for allowing us to share with all of you. But just know that I can say that we're all a we in this together and just really, really grateful to be able to be a part of um, what it means to have, you know, good community, community organizing and movement. But it's really for, you know, I know that what we do really is not just for ourselves, but for the future generations. And yeah, I'm really grateful that this path brought me to this in this way. So yeah, if there are any questions, anyone I'm open, anyone wants to share, please let, let us know. All right, thank you so much. And um, especially for calling in from the road. Um, the Run for Salmon is so inspiring to everyone here that I know. And um, last year we were really honored to be able to do a Trinity connection part of the Run for Salmon, where we ran from the Trinity Reservoir over to the Shasta Dam. Because I know not everyone is aware of this, but the Trinity River is actually diverted. A large, a lot, a lot of it is diverted into the Sacramento River, um, and then it, our waters all go to the same place and largely to the Westlands Water District to grow things like almonds for export. And it's a real travesty, and it's really ridiculous that they would talk about raising the Shasta Dam right now. Um, and on that, I just wanted to put out there that. Um, there is a comment period right now on the Shasta Dam raise. And although we do not have a petition up right yet, um, there will be a one up soon and we will be joining um, the Run for Salmon and Winamowin two people and taking action against the Shasta Dam raise later in this month as our actions for Water Action August. Um, so I really encourage people to do the Run for Salmon mini lessons, to do those lessons with their children, because everyone needs to figure out where their water comes from and how to protect it and how to honor the people that that water is going from. And I think it's really awesome also that the Run for Salmon came back up the river this year because we need to protect the adult salmon, salmon, and we need to protect the, the juvenile salmon. So we need to, to start restoring these rivers and these flows and these habitat and bring the salmon home above these dams. And um, I really wanna honor Callie Sisk and her vision to bring back the salmon to the McLeod or um, Winnemowintu River. And before we get off, I want to um, recommend uh, some reading to everyone. Also, if you wanna learn more about um, what we talked about today, because it was kind of condensed. This, I don't know if it'll come up with my background, but Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown is an amazing book for organizing um, strategy. Um, and it's written by a woman of color and it's just an amazing resource. So I encourage you to go check it out if you want to learn more about what we were kind of talking about today. 
Yeah, and we do have a few minutes left for questions and answers. So um, I have some questions for people if no one else puts a question and answer in, but please, if you can, drop a question and answer in the question and answer box. Um, and also- if, I did- if, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I did notice there was a question about the curriculum and if there are community members who would be willing to teach for the curriculum for the Run for Salmon, and there are. Um, you can definitely, um, I think there's an email oh, in, the, in the website um, to reach out and request that um, if you do want to have folks teach more. But I, I do recommend that you go in and try to do it yourself and actually see how well that work is able to be accessible and so easy to teach. So definitely check it out first. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I do see um, someone made a comment and it looks like it's kind of a question also in the um, in the comments about being very concerned about the Delta tunnels. Um, and I also think it, it's important to um, talk about that a little. Um, something that I think people should think about when we're talking about like, how do the rivers flow? Where does our water come from? You know, there these the Trinity River diversion into the Sacramento River, um, the Shasta Dam, a lot of the dams in the Sierra Nevadas, um, you know, these are all targeting like native lands and um, native waters and native um, and species that are important to native people. And so I just think it's important to think about right now, um, the fact that all these proposals um, whether it be to um, raise the Shasta Dam or um, to build the site's reservoir or to build the Delta Tunnels, they're very much connected. Um, the, the Metropolitan Water District in Southern California, which is one of the state's largest water brokers, has said that they don't want the Delta Tunnel without the, without the site's reservoir. And there's very little opposition to this reservoir and it's going to divert a lot more water from the Sacramento River and the Trinity River. And already our salmon are dying. I mean, we can't continue, we can't divert more water. We can't make more diversions. And if you look at what's going on in the cities, people are rising up and doing their part to save water. You know, they're respecting the limitations of California's rivers. And the people who aren't are people like Westlands Water District and, um, and Metropolitan. And so I just wanna put out there that, um, you know, everyone deserves the right to clean water, whether they're in the city far away or whether they're on the Trinity River or the Sacramento River. Um, but who does not need clean water is almond trees that for almonds that are getting exported to other countries. And so um, let's just think about what we're consuming, what we're eating, where our water comes from and how we can care for it a little more. And um, we're gonna also be having a lot of no Delta tunnel actions later this month because there are some comment periods coming up on that. And one of the actions we have on our change.org website um, is to tell Governor Newsom Newsom not to move forward with any major water decisions why people cannot engage. It is ridiculous that we are at home at stay at home orders with COVID-19 being the way it is and so many people do not have access to technology to engage in these meetings. When there was a Delta Tunnel hearing that we had to fight for in Northern California, um, hundreds of people from seven tribes and lots of supporters came out and said no Delta tunnels. And now they're having these meetings in secret while we can't engage. And maybe they post them online, but they don't let us know very far ahead of time. And most people can't get online. So it's really important that we tell Governor Newsom that we're not okay with the fact that he is slamming through things like the sites reservoir and Delta tunnels, why the people cannot engage. And he cannot say that he apologizes to native people or that he cares about the people of California while he's railroading these decisions that are widely unpopular. I mean, the Shasta Dam raise, which he says he does not support at this point, but the Shasta Dam raise, the sites reservoir project and the Delta tunnels have all been proposed for decades many decades, lifetimes, you know, intergenerational fights going on. And um, no, they've been voted down some of them over and over again, like the Delta tunnels. And so um, why would he be trying to get this through now why people can't engage? It's because people don't want it. Thank you so much for that, Regina. It looks like we do have some questions. 
great. Let me see here. I don't see the questions. Um, Carrie, can do you see questions? Oh, um, she. Uh, I typed them into you guys to answer, so you should just see them in the chat. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, so for everyone, how important is social media to advocacy? I remove myself from it as people can get so confrontational. However, I realize that you get called if you get called out if you don't post and you say you're an advocate. So how important is social media to these movements? Mm, I think that, um, I mean, social media is something that is has become a daily life thing in the, you know, lately. Um, and it's really, it can be really difficult to organize without it because everyone else is turning to it as a resource. And I don't think there's anything wrong with organizing without it. Like there's ways to do things in person. Um, I've done um, like uh, people signing petitions, not online, but it's, it's more of like, who are you working with? What are they doing? Are they willing to do, um, do things that don't involve social media? Um, and I think it's just bringing that conversation up with those groups. Like, what can you do uh, for those who don't have the internet or don't have those resources or just don't want to because not everyone's comfortable with it, I get it. Um, and I think it all depends on, yeah, how you communicate with that and what they're willing to do. Um, but it is, it is very difficult in this modern day. <laughs> Well, I think, I think, I think, yeah, right, Malaya, it's really hard right now, especially with the pandemic and quarantining that the door to door campaigning that I would usually do or like, I mean, my, my favorite thing is actually more one on one organizing and not, you know, this kind of way of connecting with people. Um, and there are creative ways with, you know, people, you know, caravanning and, you know, but I think really what social media has actually turned into is an information network. It's about getting your news. Like, how do you get your information? Um, how do people get their news? And if you have somebody in your, you know, who, like a neighbor or somebody who tells you, hey, this is what's happening, like, what's up? So my question would be, I'm curious how those who are not on social media, how do you get your information? How do you find out what events are happening? And then we are able to like spread that information in that way. Is it newspaper? You know, um, I'm, I, I, I still don't, I definitely value newsprint. It, it's still very important. Uh, you, just, you just talked about a book, right? But, you know, so the written word and different kinds of forms of traditional media, as they call it, are still at play. They're still effective. You can still do a flyer and hand it to somebody. But because there's a pandemic, people are less likely to like want to take something at this point. But maybe you can put it up at um, a place that does like, um, you know, a lot of food places are doing curbside pickups, but maybe there's like a sign or there's like something there where people can like, you know, tap into or find out. So it's a really a question of like, how are finding, how are people getting their information? How are they um, wanting to get involved? And and for as an organizer, being able to, to provide that access and, and sharing that information to those places. So that's another, you know, way at this point too. But great question. Yeah, and I've seen it too. I think COVID makes social media a lot more important, unfortunately, because we are all, um, unable to get together in person because I know on the Klamath River um, in person organizing means so much because there isn't great technology and there are like elders that are um, super influential influential um, that don't use social media and, and actually in those situations we've brought paper petitions around or paper letters to people and, and brought them to council meetings and um, to free dinners and um, gotten people to engage in that way. And that's also why these um, hearings being within our communities is so important instead of like far away in Sacramento because we can engage in person. But right now with COVID, it makes social media a lot more important. Um, something I have also seen be really um, effective, um, at least in the no LNG campaign, is just putting signs everywhere, like um, the campaign kind of signs. They have those, those signs everywhere in Oregon and on the Klamath River, and that's a really good way to get information out. Um, so there are some more questions. Um, one of them, and I'm going to let this go just um, maybe um, to 140 since we started a little late, if that's okay with everyone. 
Um, so one of the questions is, are there schools that have adopted, um, like um, school elementary schools that have adopted the curriculum for the Run for Salmon? And if you know if Humboldt County has been approached about that. Um, thanks for that question. I, I don't know about Humboldt County, but I do know um, there has been there have been a couple of schools who have just started. It's still really brand new. Um, before the pandemic happened, there was a, um, this actual, this curriculum was presented at, a, was gonna be presented at a multicultural educational conference for teachers. Um, it did get presented, but it was online. It was via Zoom instead. And so that just literally happened this past spring. So we'll see. Um, but I would love to come back and, and give a, a follow up and say, yeah, we're hearing a lot more of the Run for Salmon curriculum being um, adopted into school districts. I'm hoping that this online and these mini lessons um, will catch the eye of teachers and those who are doing a lot of distance learning right now that they actually bring it into their their online classrooms, too. So um, if you if. Um, I mean, there. I'm definitely. Uh, there are educators that put the curriculum together. I'll be talking with them and be asking them. And but I would love to hear from the community. And if they go to the Run for Salmon and they post Run for Salmon or hashtag Run for Salmon, uh, that they have. You know, if you're a teacher or an educator or you've used, you know, if you've looked at the the lessons and used them, please let us know. And social media is a way to do that. But I would love to know and send us an email and reach out any way that you can. Um, and hopefully we'll catch word because it would be great. We, we need to have it, especially with California fourth grade curriculum and native California, that kind of, uh, we, need, we need a lot more, we need to change that. We need a lot more educational reform in that area, especially with the indigenous uh, information. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and I would like to say too, um, there's been, um, we're going to share the Run for Salmon website under this webinar. Uh, we put all of our webinars on the Save California Salmon website, um, the links to the webinars, and then they go to the HSU um, Native American Studies YouTube page. Um, and we actually plan to try to turn this series into curriculum also. And so we would love to share the Run for Salmon curriculum as part of that effort. And if there are people who want to help with that effort, that'd be great if they wanted to reach out. Um, but our curriculum is definitely probably be more on the high school and university level that we're working on. But I think right now with the way that um, this rare opportunity we have where people are talking about real systematic change, that changing education, is such an important part of that because as long as we're learning about um, the environment in such a weird way and that we're not learning about and we're learning about Native people as being in the past in our school systems and like um, you know teaching that some of these people who are really horrible people are actually heroes then it's going to be really hard to make real change. And so people are talking about let's let's not just pull down their statues, let's take them out of our history books, or at least teach them about the real history of the way that they behaved, um, and teach about the way that cultures have continued and the way that people have continued to care for the land and water. So I think that question was awesome too. Let's make some new curriculum for sure. And let's let's all go to our schools and ask for them to teach the Run for Salmon curriculum. I'll ask, I'll ask them the Soms Bar and Orleans schools for sure. Um, so another the next question is um, can you suggest good ways to help with campaign messaging? Getting the message right is key um, to keep from polarizing potential allies. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I left the door open and I'm getting licked. <laughs> uh, Malaya, do you have anything on messaging? I know we've talked a lot about that through the dams campaign. Help with campaign messaging. I mean, um, <laughs> there's so many ways, but, and it really depends on where you are and who you're working with and how you're working with them. Like, I think building relationships and building that message as a community is the most important step. Like this isn't something that's done, you know, on a linear path. Like this is something that needs to be built from all these different groups, all these different people that you're working with. I think that's, um, 
Yeah, I think that's my best suggestion is just making sure that this is being built as a community and um, that community can be, you know, different in so many different ways. Um, but yeah, I think it's really about building that right message that gets your point across and that makes you feel empowered and feel effective in change. Yeah, um, one of the things I would say too with messaging is it's important to think about what the narrative already out there is and how that is not helpful. Um, we talk a lot about how to break down the, um, the food versus fish narrative in California because obviously a lot of the crops that are grown here are exported, like I said earlier. And so, and food and fish are food. You know, and if we, um, like Colleen always, Colleen Cisco always talks about how California was a salmon state and it needs to be again. And, you know, so many states that where their salmon runs are still healthy, that brings in so much food, healthy food, and um, really helps people with health problems and things like that. So it's kind of like, you know what, it's not cities versus rural areas, it's not farms versus fish. So um, deconstructing narratives when you're thinking about your messaging, I think is really important too. And thinking about where you have common ground in, um, in the future you wanna see, which Malaya brought up in her presentation when you're looking at your messaging. Yeah, and I think I would also quickly add that it's kind of also when you are speaking or you only have like, when we're doing public testimony or like public comment, right? And we only have one minute well, what's the one thing you want people to remember before they leave? Like, for example, recommit to re the removal of the dam. Like, recommit is even it's like one word, like when we're doing the one word cloud, right? We have that one word, we, we have the action. What is it about? There it is. And if there's one thing you remember about this, like for today, this gathering, like what is the one thing, for example, what would you take away from this moment, from this sharing of Malaya and I and all of, and Regina of this, even this workshop, like a message about this, what's the one thing and kind of go from there. So that's an idea of like, what is the one thing you want people to remember if, if you don't have, if they don't remember anything else? Yeah, and your, who your audience to is obviously really important. And I forgot to say that, like, who are you talking to? That's why the power mapping exercise is so important too, before you even get to your messaging. Um, so we have time for one last question. Um, let me just check to make sure that how many questions there are. Okay, so the last one, the last question, and hopefully we can be really quick on this one, even though it's a hard question, but it's how do you inspire people who have normalized living in a toxic um, a toxic space to not give up. It's a toxic town. So how do you inspire people who've normalized living in a toxic world to not give up? Well, um, to take that question, literally living in a toxic town such as Crescent City, <laughs> definitely organizing can be really difficult in, in those spaces. And <clears throat> if you think of it less literally, like, um you're you're in a in a in a room with someone and it's a toxic space and they're um you know building up that idea that there is no hope there's nothing that can change what not have you um living being in a toxic space can create a lot of <sighs> a lot of hardships for organizing because you know it, it's it's usually built by the trauma or ignorance or you know miseducation and i don't mean those in negative senses all always but sometimes it's just people don't understand the importance of you know really trying to build that cam campaign and getting that message out there and you know um building these campaigns with people like i and getting a sense of community like i know a lot of people just don't see because they you know have a lot of like hard walls in front of them and that's not always their fault sometimes it is and sometimes you just have to help you know a lot of this work is healing you have to be healing yourself and others to be able to do this work it's not easy not mentally either like you have to mentally heal yourself to be able to do this work um, and it, you're never fully there but it's that's why it's always a learning process you're always going to be healing and encouraging people to change and find those pathways that fit for them and for you and to be able to build those campaigns together 
and make change. So I think I think it takes a lot of healing, a lot of work, um, mental work, you know, spiritual, physical work also sometimes. So um, <laughs> I think it's it's a very it's a huge learning process as far as trying to break down those walls. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one thing I really want to add too is there, you know, there's that saying, right, that health of the land, you look at the health of the people. And if you want to know the health of the people, you look at the health of the land. Well, even when you're, you're move, doing movement work, something like the Run for Sam, and as we're at, it's, we're, there's all kinds of like, toxic exposure really going on with Big Ag and, and all of these different um communities that are being affected along a watershed, for example, and how it all impacts each other and that awareness, right? But as we are bringing awareness about how we need to bring these salmon back, um, who are not extinct, right? Who are incredibly the definition of resilience, um, who did not, who don't give up when they go upstream, right? They, they you know, they, they kind of are, salmon in themselves are teachers by themselves. Um, but, you know, as we are doing this work, we're, we're, as we're trying to heal the land, we're also trying to, we're also healing ourselves in that process. And it is not always easy and it is really hard, but I have learned that, you know, it's definitely, we, we have to, we have to learn how to also reach out and share that, hey, you know, this is hard. So I might call up Malaya and be like, Malaya, I don't know, I don't know if I can do this, you know? And so it really is important that we when we talk about community organizing, we exist because of community. We do what we do because of community, because of, of togetherness as well. So I know that I'm not the only one who may be experiencing toxicity or, or even traumas, both from the land and you know around. I mean, obviously, um, look at what climate change is. But it's also teaching us that we need to do something about it. And actually, you know, the water levels are rising, but we need to rise up. So it just depends on perspective, like how can we reshape the narrative we always have the ability to do that and we you know it's be sometimes it's day to day sometimes it's moment to moment but i do know that if the salmon who they thought were extinct can still survive and exist and we turn back home which they will do we can do this so that's kind of inspiring for me oh on that next week we're going to be um we're going to be talking about sharing your stories and how to create media. Um, and we're really excited that um, Allie Hostler from the Two Rivers Tribune um, and um, and people from News from Native California will be joining us next week. So please join us. Please also um, share the petitions, take action for your rivers and your watersheds, and um, join us next week. And don't forget to turn out turn. Um, to share this webinar series and to do your evaluation forms. It's very important that we know what you think of this series so that we can make it better as we go on. All right, and have a good day. Love each other, stay safe, wear a mask. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mahalo, thank you.